Hey guys, welcome back to the show. Today we are going to be talking about political extremism. And if you haven't seen the last video that I put out, you might want to give it a look-see just for context, but basically it was my reaction to the whole Christchurch incident and the aftermath that followed. In that video, I did mention that I thought it was a good thing to try to tackle online radicalization since this shooter, along with the Pittsburgh shooter, both participated in online forums where other users knew what they were planning and or had contributed to their radicalization. And I also brought the example of ISIS into this because they've been well known to use the web, especially social media sites, to recruit and spread their extremist message. I don't think it's a secret that radicals, like the rest of us, are using the internet as a tool to further their goals, but when looking through the comments in my previous video, I saw one that kind of made me think a bit. The person pretty much said that by saying we should tackle online extremist content, I was being hypocritical since my own videos have been called extremist and radical and I personally have been targeted by platforms like Facebook as someone who creates destructive content. Just because I've been wrongly and maliciously called an extremist or a radical by some people, that doesn't mean that I don't think actual radicalization and extremism is a serious problem in our society and actually I like to think of my videos as debunking and trying to confront radical and extremist ideologies. And especially in the context of talking about an actual terrorist attack where people were killed and mentioning groups like ISIS, I think it should be pretty clear that when I say extremists, I don't mean people who just use the Pepe meme. So there's that. But this person did make a good point, which is that when it comes to words like extremist or radical, in this day and age, they've kind of lost any and all objective meaning. Nowadays, when someone calls another person radical or extreme, it's more likely than not, especially in certain circles, that what they're actually saying is, this person disagrees with me. And that bastardization of those words, radical and extreme, that's a problem because we cannot tackle radicalization and extremism unless we can accurately point to radicalization and extremism. And I kind of touched upon it in my last video, but we're gonna go more in depth about it here. But if you want proof of just how meaningless the terms radical and extremist have become in our society, then you need look no further than the figures who are currently being blamed for inciting the Christchurch shooting. Sure, people like PewDiePie and Candace Owens were predictably yet disappointingly connected to the shooting because the attacker himself mentioned them by name, but did you know that apparently Ben Shapiro is the latest person to also be blamed for these terrible murders? In response to a YouTube tweet saying, our hearts are broken over today's terrible tragedy in New Zealand, please know we are working vigilantly to remove any violent footage. One user wrote, remove Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson from my video recommendations when I literally only use your health site to look at montages of dogs. YouTube is radicalizing a new generation of baby fascists and is wholly complicit in all of this. Another person said to pour one out for Ben Shapiro, Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris, and the other internet reactionaries who will have to pretend for a whole news cycle that they have nothing whatsoever to do with the spread of fascist Islamophobic ideology. And then you also have the user who after the shooting tweeted, today is a day I really wish I didn't know who Ben Shapiro, Lauren Southern, Nick Fuentes, Stefan Molyneux, and Steven Crowder were among many, 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 too many others. I wish I couldn't draw a direct line between these grifters and acts of terrorism, but I do and can. And in a tweet that could almost be considered funny if it weren't so terribly misinformed, somebody said, I've deliberately chosen not to watch a single video by Jordan Peterson or Ben Shapiro or anything tangentially related to their nonsense. Yet somehow, no matter what I'm watching on YouTube, it's what they recommend to me. I see you like orchids. What about white nationalism? Now, although there are other definitely non-radical content creators mentioned in those tweets, what makes Ben Shapiro's case so special is that, surprisingly enough, this isn't the first time that he's been blamed for violence against Muslims. Specifically because of their similar targets, the Christchurch shootings are being compared to the shooting that took place in a Quebec mosque. And writing about that incident yesterday, this lovely verified Twitter user wrote that the Canadian Moss shooter was influenced by Ben Shapiro's rhetoric. Shapiro is friendly with media elites and is being allowed to mainstream his image. And another user added that the New Zealand Moss shooter's manifesto claims he was radicalized online. As the facts are revealed, don't forget that last year prosecutors discovered the Quebec City Moss shooter studied Ben Shapiro's content before killing six. 
online radicalization is a serious problem. Now, because Ben Shapiro is a conservative and a critic of radical Islam and decidedly on the pro-Israel side of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I can kind of see why people are blaming Islamophobia on him. Not that I agree with it or think it's justified in any way, but I can understand how their little progressive reasoning works in that situation. But actually, as I started looking into things more, I discovered that it turns out a lot of the claims about Ben being Islamophobic, which again is just ridiculous, stem from a video he made almost five years ago called The Myth of the Tiny Radical Muslim Minority. Now the question isn't whether Islam itself is violent. It's what its adherents believe, because that's what they act upon. We're really not talking about people who are active terrorists. Radical beliefs are a lot broader than terrorists, and anybody who argues otherwise is being naive or foolish or disingenuous. But terrorists draw their moral, financial, and religious support from those who are not terrorists themselves. So, who are the radicals? According to one 2009 poll, it showed almost 50% of Indonesians actually support strict Sharia law, not just in Indonesia, but in a lot of countries, and 70% blamed the United States, Israel, or somebody else for 9-11. So, you make that calculation, it's about 143 million people who are radicalized. You scared yet? You know, we're just getting started. Okay, Egypt, 80 million Muslims. According to that same 2009 poll, it showed that 65% want strict Sharia law in every Islamic country, and almost 70% said that they had positive or mixed feelings about bin Laden. So that's 55.2 million more radicals. Here is the total of the countries that we've gone through just now. 680 million, 30,000. 680 million, 30,000 radical Muslims. And that's out of a total population in those countries of 942.4 million Muslims total. And it seems fair to assume that similar proportions of people in countries like, say, like Algeria, Syria, Sudan, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Tunisia, Somalia, and Libya are also radicalized. And if they are, then, well, we're above 800 million Muslims who are radicalized. More than half the Muslims on Earth. That's not a minority, that's now a majority. Those are some clips from that video, but it's over six minutes long, so if you want to watch it in its entirety, you can find it on YouTube under the channel Truth Revolt Originals. And regarding the video's contents, I do have to say that as someone who studied the history, cultures, and religions of the Middle East, including Islam and university, a lot of the criticism you find about Islam, especially what's on the internet, tends to lack nuance or just, in general, accurate information. And that's coming from me, someone who if you watch my videos you know is hugely against Islamic fundamentalism. But the thing with Ben's video is that it's not like that at all. Ben's video just quantitatively examines the self-reported beliefs of people in Muslim countries. How, how is that Islamophobic at all? And actually Ben is doing this to address the issue of radicalization. How is trying to address radicalization, which you cannot deny is a problem in Islam, in and of itself, radicalization? And the problem I have with bad takes on Islam and what I think is actually an extremist thing to do is when people paint things with extremely broad and general brushstrokes. When people say all Muslims this or all Muslims that, it does sound ignorant because Muslims, like any other religious group, are not a hegemon. And yeah, sure, we can say they are more likely to be extremists than members of different faiths, but still, it's hashtag not all. I, I, I get that and I agree with that. But still, that's not at all what Penn was doing. He's objectively looking at different percentages and even though his video concludes that radical Muslims are not some tiny minority, he still never claims that all of them are extremists or that all of them are out to kill people. It's just strange to me how people who I think are fairly and rightly criticizing Islam in the wake of Islamic terror attacks are being called radicals in the wake of anti-Muslim attacks by people who I I'm pretty sure I'm guessing would never ever dream to say that all Muslims are responsible for the acts of Islamic terrorists. It just seems like a bit of a double standard to me and I think we should be able to criticize Islam, especially the fundamentalist sects, without saying that every Muslim out there is is evil or a murderer, which of course is not true. And likewise, we should be able to criticize Islamophobia and, and white supremacists without saying that every single critic of Islam or mass immigration or every single right winger is complicit in a terrorist attack. Seems simple enough to me, but apparently it's not. And actually, as we found out this past weekend, it's not just right wingers who are being accused of spreading Islamophobia. As she was attending a vigil for the Christchurch shootings, Chelsea Clinton was confronted by this young woman. After all that you have done and all this on the podium that you have so I'm so sorry. Well, certainly, it was never my intention. I do believe words matter. I believe we have to show We do matter. And this, this, this right here, 
is the result of a massacre stoked by people like you and the words that you have put out into the world. And I want you to know that and I want you to feel that deep inside. The 49 people died because of the rhetoric that you put out there. When I first saw that clip, I, I gotta admit, I was a bit confused because although I am no fan of any of the Clintons, Islamophobic is not a label that I would attribute to Chelsea Clinton. Honestly, at first, I didn't even get what could have motivated this person to go on this tirade against Chelsea, but it turns out that that grudge, like many others, began on Twitter. You see, earlier this year, someone asked Ilan Omar would love to know who she thinks is paying American politicians to be pro-Israel, to which Omar replied, APAC! Exclamation point. To which someone else asked, please learn how to talk about Jews in a non-anti-Semitic way. Sincerely, American Jews. To which Chelsea Clinton replied, co-signed as an American. We should expect all elected officials, regardless of party, and all public figures to not traffic in anti-Semitism. Don't get me wrong, Ilan Omar has said some pretty anti-Semitic stuff, like that Israel is hypnotizing the world, but personally, I don't necessarily think it's inherently anti-Semitic to criticize Israel or AIPAC. So I don't really agree with the person who replied to Omar asking her to not talk about Jews in an anti-Semitic way because I don't really think that's what she was doing. But still, what Chelsea Clinton said uh, in and of itself is in no way Islamophobic. Like, not, not at all. And Clinton then replied to another person that she is looking forward to talking to the congresswoman about the cancer of anti-Semitism in our country and why her comments trouble me and more. To which Ilan herself replied, Chelsea, I would be happy to talk. We must call out smears from the GOP and their allies, and I believe we can do that without criticizing people for their faith. I look forward to building an inclusive movement for justice with you. That swipe at the GOP is pretty ridiculous considering she was the one being accused of anti-Semitism, but I mean, still, it seems like even Omar herself didn't find Chelsea's comments Islamophobic. It's not Islamophobic to criticize someone for potentially being anti-Semitic. And actually, considering that Jews are still the number one group most targeted for hate crimes, does that mean that we can say that Ilan Omar is complicit in all those attacks because apparently this is how the world works now? You see what I mean? Calling someone radical or extreme has become just so politicized, which is frustrating because there are radicals on the right, on the left, uh, among religious groups, and we should be willing to call them all out equally. You want to know what actually counts as radicalism, what's really extreme? How about we talk about violence? Okay, because all those people who are calling out Ben Shapiro's radicalism, it seems like they are all too keen to just gloss over real physical violence that is happening because it doesn't really fit with their narrative. Yes, the Pittsburgh and the Christchurch shooters were violent radical extremists. But if you actually want to tackle the issue of political radicalization, then you can't ignore groups like Antifa. <laughs> Because no doubt, although there haven't been Antifa mass shooters, there are way more Antifa members out there than white supremacists. And Antifa members who are willing to beat up their political opponents. And obviously in this conversation, we especially cannot ignore groups like ISIS. They are literally the worst. And you know what? We don't need to wait until violence is actually committed until we start calling someone a radical. I, I agree with that because you know what else extremists have in common? They don't just commit violence, but they also see it as a political tool. I mean, we're talking about about Richard Spencer, who uh, publishes in altright.com, publishes an article uh, on July 28th by a man named Vincent Law, uh, where the headline was, to protect free speech, get rid of democracy. Um, so I, we really okay, have well, to- I, you know what, I, wait, okay, so let's, let's use that example. I disagree with that. I haven't seen the piece, but it doesn't sound like something I'd agree with. It's, it's not. <laughs> Does Richard Spencer have a right to speak in public. Richard Spencer is a danger to society. When he speaks in public, what he is doing, he is publicly recruiting people to his very violent movement, very violent okay, ideology. So does, 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 does he have a right to speak in public? I don't think he has a right to speak in public unopposed, and that is ultimately what the purpose of Antifa is, is to show well, up and, and oppose him. But it's not opposition. You shut people down, you prevent them from speaking, and you commit violence against it's them. I know a number of people, well, don't tell me it's untrue, I know people who have been knocked down and beaten by people from Antifa. So that is true. It does happen. We have it on tape. We just roll the tape. Right. So you're saying, is that justified? Yes. I believe that communities have the right to defend themselves against threats to, them, to their community. Against ideas they don't like. 
No, they against, have a right against, to commit against violence. people who have explicitly said that they want to eliminate those people from our society. But I you're conflating, you're conflating violence with ideas. With Antifa, for example, there is an entire line of rhetoric that justifies violence against fascists, i.e. anyone who doesn't agree with them, in order to say that it was self-defense in the long term. If you ask me, that kind of thinking is extreme, and it's a mentality that all extremists share. If you look at the Islamic radicals, for example, they believe that they're justified in using violence because of the West military intervention in Muslim countries, because of all the Muslim casualties that have been killed by Western military forces. I mean, which is true, that, that has happened doesn't justify terrorist bombings though, but in their minds, it does. If you ask an Antifa member, they'll probably say, yeah, I can, I can punch someone like this in the face because they're advocating for policies which historically have hurt people and therefore by, by attacking him violently, I'm just preventing more bad things from happening. I'm justified. And likewise, Islamophobes, white identitarians like the Christchurch shooter might look at a mosque attended by families, children as young as three years old, and think to himself, look at all the Westerners who have been killed by Muslims. Look at all the Western women who have been raped or assaulted by Muslim refugees. I have to send a message to these people that it's not okay for them to come to our country. Violence is okay because I need to protect us. It's all the same. And what is so scary about extremism and radicalization is that there's, there's grains of truth in all of those ideologies. Yes, fascism and white supremacy are terrible ideologies that have killed people. Yes, Western countries have invaded Muslim countries and killed a lot of people. Yes, Islamic fundamentalism and mass migration are serious issues that have killed people. Those things are problems, but as us normal, rational people know, there are methods and ways to solve them that don't involve going out and randomly killing or hurting people. And that kind of leads to the other signs of extremism, the binary thinking. It's always black and white or us versus them, the dehumanization of the other side, the inability to see them as humans, as individuals, as not just part of a larger group who's trying to attack you. And finally, the willingness or the desire to subvert the government and political norms, that it's either your way or the highway. If not everyone is on board with what you want to do, then you're taking matters into your own hands and going vigilante justice at it. There is so much more that we could go into about this topic, but I think that's all I have to say for now. But as always, I would love to know what you guys think. Is actual extremism, and I'm not talking about the Ben Shapiro's and the Pepe's of the world, but is actual violent extremism a growing problem in this world or are we just blowing things out of proportion? And if it is a problem, then what's the best way to go about combating it? But that's it for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you next time.